Thank you, Brock. This was amazing. You know, let me just say that I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship and venture capital everywhere in the world. Obviously, you know, friends with a lot of amazing people from Turkey. I think it's a thriving ecosystem. And uh, and frankly, that region of the world is very exciting because I think entrepreneurship really does have the chance, best chance to make the world into the place that we want to live in. We're creating a lot of problems in the world and entrepreneurship is fixing a lot of those problems as well. And so we really need people. Here's how I'm going to leave everyone with this thought. If you see something that's a problem, fix it. If you're passionate about that particular problem, then start a company. And if there's a problem set that you're really passionate about, start a fund. And that's how we're going to get out of the problems that we're facing in the world today. Fixing everything that you see, starting companies to fix things that you care about, and starting funds to fix wider problem sets. Hi, Adeo. Welcome to the podcast. I truly appreciate all efforts you put into VC Lab. As an alumni, I have learned a tremendous amount and launched my venture capital journey. Thanks for your tough feedback and disciplined curriculum. It's great to have you here to share your insights with us today. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here as well. And you were in one of the earlier programs that I would say, you know, every program, we completely rewrite the curriculum and redo how we do things. So we've actually, since you've been in, we've cut a month off the program because what we're finding is we can get people to a close in four or five or six months. And back when you went through it, it was taking, you know, six to 12 months. So now we've literally, you know, cut tons of time off. We've streamlined everything. We're helping people go after institutional investors, whereas before we were really helping people focus on initially what we'll call confidants. So there's been a big journey since you've been through and an exciting one as well. It was the second one. Before going to VC Labs, I would like to ask you, your path has been spent startups, VCs, nonprofits and more. How do you determine when to move on from a project to the next challenge now because you have founded a Founders Institute, now VC Labs. Yeah, so look, my drive, I look at myself as a societal engineer, right? I look at society, I look at problems in society such as climate change, and then I say, what are things that I can do to make society more resilient, more safe, less war, better outcomes, and the like? And, you know, look, it's a, it's a path that's been littered with failure. Um, you know, I started out and I saw the internet and I was like, wow, this is going to really transform society for the better. And it's definitely been or had a lot of positive effects, but it's had a lot of negative effects as well. In fact, I would argue it's had almost as many unintended negative consequences as it's had positive consequences to society. So, you know, I, and then, you know, for example, I said after, after really trying to help the internet become mainstream, I looked at video games and I said, look, if we can make video games, it could be the first time we really simulate what society can be like. And, and actually, I think games have just been mostly net negative, uh, not and with no net positive. And I think a lot of people working in games, you know, just said, ah, you know, we're just going to make shooter games and things like that, not really try and create smart simulations, AI, etc. But I really thought games might be a playground for humanity to start thinking about what does it look like when we have our own AI, et cetera. And that, that didn't really work out. I did a lot of work on the X Prize, the board of directors leading the organization, trying to put large prizes in place to solve humanity's grand challenges. And there was a lot of positive effects that the private space industry was pretty much born out of that initiative. And I think that's mostly a net positive as well. But again, there's a lot of net negatives there too, because I don't think the X Prize and the prize model worked like we anticipated. A lot of times you can set the direction correctly, but what is a $10 million prize when you're trying to solve human gene sequencing? It's like a rounding error on a contract with Pfizer. So they don't even want the prize if you, if you figure it out. 
like the prize is meaningless. And then I just decided I'm going to work on entrepreneurship. And we there, it's showing some of the most promise. You know, we've brought entrepreneurship through the Founder Institute to most areas of the world, from the most remote regions of Africa to crazy middle of nowhere places in Central Asia, all across LATAM. The Founder Institute has spread entrepreneurship at scale. And then we realized like, wait a minute, there are all these entrepreneurs, but they have a glass ceiling. And that glass ceiling is you can't take your company from A to B without venture capital. You can get from like nothing to A with scrounging resources, maybe raising some local angel money, friends and family money, stuff like that. But if you really want to get to the next level, you need venture. And we looked around the world at the time which was uh, uh, 2020, you know, at the, at the end of 2000, the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic. And at that time, you could count on kind of one hand where all the major hubs of venture capital were worldwide. And they ended up, if you were an entrepreneur in Central Asia, Africa, or wherever, and you had a good idea, you would leave and move there. It was that simple. And we said, that's not really realistic. That's not helping the world move forward. So then we started the venture side. And I am most optimistic of all the things that I've done in my life, that entrepreneurs working on meaningful problems funded by ethical investors have the greatest prospect of fixing the problems in the world on a macro level. You helped, I mean, you launched many accelerator programs, Founders Institute, VC Lab, and also lots of sub programs. Uh, What do you think that accelerators provide founders and also emerging managers today that is unique compared to other resources? Because we are having lots of resources nowadays on YouTube and blogs and everywhere. It really depends, right? I mean, I think there's you know, I've run more accelerator programs directly and indirectly than any, well, everyone else in the world combined. I know the Founder Institute is approaching, you know, a few thousand programs that have run, like maybe three programs. Uh, and then VC Lab is on cohort 16, I think. Uh, well, we're, we're recruiting for 15 now, planning 16. We'll be at 17 or 18 programs by the end of this year, possibly more. And that's just that we also have an LP program and we have we train associates as well at the parent company of VC Lab is called Decile Group. So accelerators do different things, right? So it's not, you can't just glump them together and say, hey, what are the value that accelerators add? So like a, a Y Combinator, for example, which is the gold standard, but it's a gold standard really in late kind of later funding accelerators. So if you have a team and you have an idea and you have some initial product market, I would even call it, it does not necessarily product market fit, but you have some initial sense that the product has some resonance in a market. Then you go to uh, IC and they'll help you accelerate your product market fit and get in front of investors and get really kind of high terms. Now, that's not necessarily great for everyone. And if you get a great term sheet, that doesn't guarantee you're going to have a great outcome, right? A $20 million valuation for an, you know, post idea stage company is really high. And those companies have to justify that valuation. So I would actually argue that a lot of the death that happens in YC companies is because their valuations are too high, given what the idea is. And, you know, and that's just a product of YC. But if that's what you want, YC is a place, great place to go, right? It was conversely like a founder institute. They're really like, I have an idea and a job, right? That's who we target. I have an idea and a job. They're not going to get into YC. They're not going to get into tech stars. They're not going to get into anything because they have a job, right? And I want to validate that my idea is good enough and work on it enough to form a team and get started. And we have lots of people that have gone through Founder Institute, then gone through YC or gone through tech stars. Gone- so again, because they're very different, right? And in, in, in our world, in the Founder Institute world, what we really care about is, you know, hey, are you taking this opportunity seriously, right? Because a lot of people, they have an idea and a job and they take their job seriously and they're moonlighting with their idea. And so the first test is like, are you serious about your idea? And we push people. And if they're not serious about their idea, and a lot of people in that process realize, hey, wait a minute, 
I'm not serious about this idea. Then they leave the program and we focus on the people that are serious about the idea and really help them to get it off the ground. And we, we've, you know, Founder Institute as a result of that, um, <clears throat> It was very early. We're way earlier than anyone else. I don't know. We're not eight or nine companies that we've helped launch around the world. Tons of them have failed because we're so early. But we're also, as a result of the ones that have succeeded, we're the second largest accelerator to YC in the world by, by almost every metric. And we're the largest on some metrics. So obviously, we run more programs than anyone else. We operate more locations than anyone else. You know, we run more. We're the largest event organizer in the world on a number of metrics, right? So number of events, number of locations, et cetera. Attendees of events, there are single events that are enormous. They have a few hundred thousand people attend, so they have more attendees. But so, you know, again, back to the core question, though, I think when you look at an accelerator, you have to really say, what is this accelerator trying to do, right? And then, and look at how it does it and then, and then evaluate if they're doing a good job or not. Right. And, and different accelerators do very different things. And like, and just to contrast Founder Institute, VC Lab is, is radically different than the Founder Institute. It uses a lot of the same principles, but we're, instead of most people who go into VC Lab, they're dead serious about starting a fund. They're not necessarily moonlighting. They're, they're saying, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it full time. Maybe they're quitting their job or transitioning their career or whatever, but they're like, I'm going to make this happen. And, you know, we, we work and try as much as possible with them to make it happen. And, and one of the big differences is that you brought up in the intro is, of the question is that there's a lot of free resources in the world today about how to start a company. And really then the Founder Institute is really helping the person to be ready to make this big commitment. Whereas in VC Lab, there's nothing. You can't read anything anywhere. And that's correct. Most of the stuff that's online is actually wrong. So you can't read anything. There's no luminary that's written amazing books on how to start a fund. There's no like guides anywhere. There's no product market fit. There's no Eric Reese. There's nothing. So basically, if you want to get started in venture, yeah, there's only one thing in the world that has the proper resources and, and guides and strategies and tactics. And that's right now VC Lab, period. So how do you again, keep, it really differs. How do you keep the curriculum updated in VC Lab? And also, are there any differences culturally in different geographies for the Founders Institute? Because I know that VC Lab has one batch and everyone gets the same courses and also curriculum. But in Founders Institute, different geographies, different batches. Yeah. Well, I'll do the curriculum and then I'll talk about the geolocation, if you will. <laughs> so on the curriculum front, the world's changing really fast in venture for sure. The, I would say the world's changing really fast, period. And then the world world adventure is changing as fast as the fastest stuff is changing in the world. So, you know, through the pandemic, just to give a super easy example, when we originally started, it was before the pandemic, it was a side project at the Founder Institute, and we spun it out and created a separate company called VC Lab once, once it just took off. But our, our initial thesis was, hey, you know, you raise money as a VC from people called limited partners by going out and meeting them at events and conferences, and then you build those relationships and convert them into investment. Okay. Now, so we partnered with like the likes of web summits, all the major events around the world, large and small. And we were planning to run side events for general partners and limited partners to meet at these big events. And then the pandemic happened. Right. Well, that wasn't going to happen. So we had to completely redo all our thinking, all the curriculum. And there's been changes like that happening every few months. Like how do you meet LPs has been changing. How do you invest in companies has been changing. What are fair terms has been changing. And it's been changing like a lot. Right. Like there was a in the midst of all this, there was a huge boom. Then there was a collapse, right? And now we're kind of coming into a boom again. Limited partners were super excited about the asset class and they all pulled out. Now they're super excited about the asset class again. It's just, it's been a roller coaster ride. And we've been updating the program 
to match the reality in the world as these changes are happening. So if you go into and how it gets done is we rewrite the curriculum every single time from scratch. We're on cohort 14 and we're on that's running right now. We're recruiting for 15 and planning 16 and cohort 14 every week we rewrite the curriculum for that week. Now, back to your question about geolocation. So the reason you don't like venture capital is not as local as it seems. Like, for example, you went into Estonia. I would consider that a mistake. You'll find this out the hard way, uh, cause, especially because you're in Turkey. So there's really no reason to be in Estonia except you know, creating havocs and headaches for yourself. You should have done the U.S. And, and now we would just be like, do not do Estonia, right? So there is, in the world of venture, it's much, much smaller than entrepreneurship, right? We know what the numbers are. So we see about three people a quarter. It's been growing, actually. It used to be two and then 20. Now it's about three and a quarter. Worldwide, come to us and say, I want to start a fund. And we're maybe half or more of the total market. So we're very large, but the market it's actually growing and we don't know how big the market is because there's no accurate stats. There's no one who reports anything. Okay. So that's just relatively small, like 15th and people a year, 12th and people a year, you know, probably this year, maybe a little more, but it's, it's not enormous. Meanwhile, in New York city, there's probably 15 people right now that want to start a company right now like right this second, not over the whole year. So there's entrepreneurship is orders of magnitude larger than venture. And so this next thing is that the ideas that the entrepreneurs work on are very different in New York than in Central Asia. Central Asia doesn't have e-commerce infrastructure. Central Asia doesn't have payment infrastructure in some countries, right? So you can't be like, I'm starting an e-commerce site with credit cards in Central Asia, it just won't work, right? Because there's no infrastructure. So you could start an infrastructure company in a lot of places in Central Asia, and it would totally work. So you have to localize the programs. You don't even have to necessarily teach them differently, right? Because they still need to understand product market fit. They still need to have an idea that's viable, but you it has to be localized because an idea in Central Asia may make perfect sense in Central Asia and absolutely no sense in, in the West and in New York, right? So what, what Founder Institute has done is we've taken the core principles of entrepreneurship and brought them worldwide. So everyone knows about product market fit, lean startup, stuff like that. All these kind of great seminal ideas of entrepreneurship we brought around the world. But then we've localized it with local mentors, local leaders that understand the market that the entrepreneur is in and can say, this idea won't work here. Right. And there's so many examples of that I could regale you with a lot. But, you know, obviously, for example, Indonesia is a massive country with the largest amount of human population coming online. But it's a lot of little islands and a big city in Jakarta. So doing something in Indonesia, there's a massive market opportunity. It's a very social company country. It's the number one user of social media in the world but it's per capita, but it's very unique. So you have to actually come up with ideas that work in Indonesia and probably wouldn't work anywhere else. I will ask questions about VC labs, but before going to that, do you remember how do you select Udemy with Eren Bali? Because it is also a success story coming from Turkey. I know Eren is also a great entrepreneur. So do you remember the selection process? Oh yeah, of course. I'm still friends and we talk <laughs> pretty often. Um, you know, I'm an advisor to his second company. That's been a great friendship. I love Aaron. He's just amazing. You know, he's an amazing person, an amazing entrepreneur, very thoughtful. He actually spoke at our last Founder Institute event. We had a lot of the OG we brought back. It was a maybe 15 year anniversary. And we brought back people from that first cohort, like Aaron, Jason Kalkanis, Peter Pham, et cetera, had them all on stage. There was a moment where they were literally all on stage. It was really just amazing. Yeah. So Aaron, look, one of the nicest things about the Founder Institute that I'm most proud of is it's very, it's non-biased. So we use predictive admission. We call it the predictive admissions test or the entrepreneur DNA. And so you take a roughly 20 minute test and it's able to to assess 
how good you are as an entrepreneur by reviewing your psychometrics. And it turns out that like entrepreneurship has a psychometric profile. It's not like all things, right? You know, you could be not so tall and a great basketball player, but if you're really tall, your chances of being a great basketball player are much better. And similarly with entrepreneurship, there's certain traits like height that make you better at entrepreneurship intrinsically than if you don't have them, right? So we measure those. And that means that everyone gets a fair shake. Now, look, you may not have the DNA, so to speak. A lot of these are traced back to genetics, the traits that we measure that are successful for entrepreneurship, such as openness. It's largely a genetic trait. The more open-minded you are, the more likely you're to succeed as an entrepreneur. Because if you're closed-minded, you don't see the opportunities. But if you're open-minded, you, you can see things that other people might miss because they're myopically looking at stuff. And that's a genetic trait as an example. So we, we primarily admit people in the Founder Institute based on their test results. And this makes it very fair, right? It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what gender you are or none of that matters. All that matters is are you more likely to succeed as an entrepreneur or not? And you can actually take that test today if you're curious and see the results. We give you a pretty, it's amazing. We give you a very detailed report. And I think it's FI slash DNA like entrepreneur DNA. So just upper or lowercase D. But back to the point. So Aaron, you know, he had the traits. When he got into the program, his English was really horrific. It's better now, but it's still not great. If he were on the show, most people, you would need to put like a translator at the bottom. And, and he knows this. He's actually working on it uh, to, to make his English better. Um, and it's and it is a lot better, but it still has a ways to go. So you could barely understand it when he was on stage. It was like, ah, uh, what are you saying? But he definitely he, he, the funny thing was he had this idea. And I remember it like it was yesterday of essentially like a it was LinkedIn for companies. Right. So instead of the person, it would like ah, we will make the company the main thing and the companies could connect with each other. And it wasn't like that terrible of an idea, but you know, it wasn't that great of an idea. There was LinkedIn at the time. There was also Zoom, which was very big. And so it's like, how are you going to win? Like, who's going to do this? You know, so it wasn't the best idea ever. And then during the program, he's like, I was working on this other learning thing. And, you know, because I'm like, this idea isn't very good. And do you have anything else? He's like, I actually do I have this learning thing. I'm like, OK, maybe that's not the best idea either. Let's take a look. And he showed it to me. And it was amazing. It was the idea itself was like, OK, but the technology was amazing. And I was like, wow, if this, this thing could really take off, like I could see lots of use cases for it. Um, and so I'm like, why don't you just do that? Because it's and he built most of it. So it was actually mostly built, whereas the other thing was still just an idea. And he did. And the rest is history. They obviously did very well. And, you know, he cares a lot about Turkey, too. He's a huge supporter. Uh, you know, he comes back to and helps out and hires people there and has teams there and donates when there's natural disasters. So he's a huge, huge supporter of Turkey and everything happening in the country. He's a figure inspiring new entrepreneurs for sure and new founders because he's a success story. Not only a successful company, but also went to an IPO and also started a new company, which also became Unicorn. So he's really a success story of Turkey. Additionally, did you develop the test internally or is it an entrepreneur DNA test is publicly available that you implemented to your process? Uh, <clears throat> we worked with a controversial figure in the world, a gentleman named Jordan Peterson, who's actually a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, to be precise. He's great. I mean, he's, uh, I think he's become a little bit more extreme in his older age. Uh, you know, back when I was dealing with him, he was more like a kind of nutty university professor. Nowadays, he's like world famous and fills stadiums with people, but he's become much more extreme. But Jordan understands the mind as well as anyone on the planet. He might be, he's just a seminal psychologist. I don't think all his views are right, but but he under, definitely understands the mind much better than most. And he was able to develop a test with us that 
really was very difficult to, to fake, right? Because he would, we were just trying to measure at that time five things. Now we measure more because we updated the test and we're no longer working with Jordan. We've modernized the test a lot. But when we began, we were working very closely with Jordan and we were really measuring five things. Test would take about an hour and it would ask kind of the same thing over and over again in slightly different ways and really try to drive at these things. And, and we, you know, uh, we made like groundbreaking discoveries on social science that uh, to this day are probably um we, we've run one of the largest longitudinal, if not the probably the largest longitudinal study of psychology in history. And we learned a tremendous amount about what makes an entrepreneur tick and how, what makes a successful entrepreneur, what makes a failed entrepreneur. I mean, it's mind-blowing, actually. If a candidate cannot pass the test, so do you accept in the Founders Institute? Or uh, it's not really pass-fail, right? Okay. So... Um, I mean, that's sort of a misnomer, right? It does ultimately result in a pass-fail because some people get in, some people don't get in. Pass-fail, right? But it's not a pass-fail test. It's, it's, it's totally a sliding scale on a number of different attributes. But the, look, here's the... It turns out that there are certain attributes that if you have, you're almost going to fail. And we call these... Well, take a step back. There's... There, problematic attributes that we call flags and there's colors of flags yellow orange and red and if you have red flags it's like you're just there you're gonna fail like a hundred percent of the time so and there's certain red flags that not only are you gonna fail but you're gonna like destroy the program in the process because you can't like a lot of people are like i'm not the problem you're the problem It's like, no, actually, actually, you are the problem. No, it's you're the problem. It's like, no, we're pretty sure you're the problem. We, you took the test, you got a red flag, and so you got us. <laughs> and like, but they get, they're like, God damn you, you and your agadagadar. And they get, we call it the flag founder revolt we have a name for it it happens sometimes people like have other people take the test and they get in and they're flag and we're like oh this is a flag founder flag founder revolt and it's really problematic like it causes programs to fail in some cases we're really good at handling it right now so very rarely does that happen anymore and we screen really well so i would say like for the most part it's not pass fail it's like a gradient But there are these red flags. And if you have a red flag, it's like very dangerous. It's not good for anybody, right? It's not good for you to try and be an entrepreneur because you, if you're going to, it's going to cause you to have a mental breakdown. Right. And it's not good for us to have you in the program, because in that process of having a mental breakdown, you're going to try and destroy everything around you. Right. So I would look at it more like we're, we're helping people to be the best version of themselves by avoiding a career that is really not suited to their core personality. Do you also develop for the fund managers a test, DNA test? No. And here's the reason why. We've been thinking about it, but we don't. Um, let's start with a simple thing. We've run 16 cohorts or 14 cohorts that started and we're planning our 16th recruiting for the 15th. So 14 operate. I think once we're like, this might be a flag founder revolt. Maybe, maybe not. Like usually if it is a flag founder revolt, you know. There's no, there's not like, is this a flag founder revolt? I don't really know. It's like, no, you, you definitely know. So once in 14 programs, we had what we're like, this is it, like, let's monitor it. I don't think it was. Everything worked out fine. So I, usually if there's a flag founder revolt, things don't work out fine. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, you gotta, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So, and, and, and the, the reason is that, you know, to even want to be a VC, you have to be really good. There's no, you have to, you're, it's a career only available to the best of the best of us, right? It's not like, oh, whereas entrepreneurship is a career that's available to almost anyone, Because you can have an idea and start a company and it doesn't really take a lot of anything, just your will, right? I would say the most important attribute of a successful entrepreneur is the will to succeed. And everyone can have that. 
Conversely, if you want to start a venture capital fund, you've got to be in the top one. So that just to get in the door to launch a firm, you have to be amazing. And so our admissions process is like, are you amazing or not? And we do try and give people who are possibly amazing a shot. We're not totally exclusionary, but you know, let, let's like cut to the chase. You've got to go to people that you don't know as a venture capitalist and ask them to stake you with millions of dollars to invest blindly into companies. I mean, think about that. Hey, give me, you don't know me, millions of dollars and to trust me to invest in blindly into things that you just have to trust that I'm going to do. And like, you can't just walk off the street and do that. You have to have like pedigree, credibility, past experience, access to the wealthy people to do that. This is just not, so it's within, meanwhile, or conversely with an entrepreneur, it's like, I have an idea, I'm going to make it happen, right? Anyone can do that. So, you know, we're not really, we don't need a test per se, because just to get to the level to say that you want to be a VC, you have to have so much wind in your sails, so much credibility, so much track record, so much, you know, you're really at the top peak of your game that we're not, we don't need a test because they're already awesome. But the follow-up question will be, you have seen lots of emerging managers and new managers. What are the common mistakes that these managers do during the period of cohorts and also afterwards? Look, I mean, the biggest mistake that someone makes, and I'm, I'm dead serious on this, is they don't go into the VC Lab program. It's completely free. So like you can literally look at someone not VC Lab and VC Lab, and they spend five times as much time to do the same thing because we give you tools we give you systems we give you connections we give you a network all this stuff so if you don't have that we literally see it it's five times as much time to accomplish the same objective but then you know a lot of people if we hand them everything on a silver platter which is what vc for free which is what the vc lab program does they don't do it and they don't listen And then they too run into lots of problems and they, by the way, often drop out. So, you know, the common areas that we see people make this mistake all the time, I would say they're too. So everything that's on the internet, unless it's written by us about venture capital and starting a venture capital firm is wrong. Okay. And it's wrong for two reasons. One, it's wrong because it's just literally wrong. It's just not right. It's like, and I'll give an example of it in a moment. And two, because venture capital is broken. And so if someone's like, who's practicing a broken thing, morally bankrupt, you know, doing things the wrong way, and they're like, this is how you do it. Well, obviously they're going to, You're going to wind up doing things in a wrong and morally bankrupt way because the person writing on how to do it is wrong and morally bankrupt, right? So like a very common thing that it's a too common, very conventional, everyone will tell you this, okay? And you're going to read it online and it's just wrong. It's literally wrong. Okay, then two very, very common ones. Number one, fund size. You need a bigger fund size. You know, you definitely have to have a bigger fund size. Okay, well, that's just wrong, right? So your fund one is an MVP, okay? It's like, I want it like, just like a startup MVP, right? When As a startup, when you build something, you don't build the whole thing. You build a little bit and you test it. And if it works, you're like, okay, fund one is like that. It's a little MVP that you go out and test. And if it all works great, then you expand. Okay. And so your fund one size, I'll tell you right now in a developing market, it should be 2.5 to $5 million in a developed market. It should be five to $10 million period. There are some exceptions to that rule where it could be a bit larger, but I wouldn't, let's say you're like, I'm an exception. Okay. I want to do a $20 million fund one. Okay. I would still set your fund size at 10 because it's fund models scale up but they don't scale down. So start at 10 and get to 20. Then you look like a hero versus starting at 20 and getting to 10 and you look like a total failure. And we see this all day long. So at this point, we're like, look, if you're not going to set your fund size, at something that you can definitely beat. We're going to just remove you from the program. 
because it's just like I don't want to watch you fail in slow mo. Like that's not my goal here. And I can't tell you how many times people are like, "You don't understand it, Dale." Okay. And then they like are like, "I can't raise my fun size." You were right. Oh, really? Like we hear that all the time. I mean, no offense, you're probably in that bucket. Now, back to the second mistake that we see people make, and this is like, so it's conventional wisdom in venture capital that you get what's called anchor, which is somewhat like a lead investor in the startup world. And the anchor investor puts in a big number, like 10 or 20 of the fund size. Now, I don't even know how this is conventional wisdom because it's like beyond wrong. So maybe 20 years ago, that's the way things were done. And a lot of VCs you talk to started their career 20 years ago. So they're like, yeah, get an anchor investor. (laughs) You know, white dude. It's like, when did you start your career? It's like, okay, so in the 90s and maybe two, then you would get an anchor investor. And so if you talk to an old school VC, who's, you know, they'll be like, get an anchor investor, right? But that's not how it's done today at all. So, and, and why the anchor existed is the only way you could get into venture capital 20 years ago was you started and worked your way up. So you started as an associate, then you became a principal, then you became a partner, and then you're like, I'm going to break out on my own. And what would happen is one of the investors in the fund where you were a partner would say, I'll stake you to start your new fund. Okay, and I will be the anchor investor. But that, you know, the apprenticeship model's gone in venture. No, it, it never really worked anyway. None of these funds have succession plans. So all the funds are failing right now that are old. Like DFJ is gone, right? Tons of funds are gone because they didn't, success, you know, like Sequoia and Lightspeed are really the only two. Kleiner Perkins, no one's around from that. It still has the name, but it's like no one's there that was there before. And they did a terrible job in succession planning. So like succession planning has been the bane of the existence. So that apprenticeship model failed, anchor models gone, and people are still told to get an anchor. And, And what ends up happening as a result is you have these managers, so big investors in funds, they are paid to meet with managers. So their job is to meet with you. They'll meet with you all day long. And you're like, God, I'm meeting with all these people. It's amazing. But they won't invest, right? So you're chasing this anchor. I'm going to get an anchor. No, you won't. And, you know, and, and anchors don't exist anymore. They meet with these big firms and funds that are just wasting these managers time because they'll meet with you. They're paid to meet with you, right? That's their job. And But they have no intention of investing in your first close or even in your first fund. But they'll meet with you anyway. And so a lot of managers are like, yeah, yeah, you don't understand it, Dale. I've got all these meetings. I'm like, yeah, they're they're never going to invest. And then they find out that the anchor is a fallacy. And, you know, I, I probably should write an article like the anchor is dead. But, you know, I don't have time to write these articles. And that's why the knowledge isn't changed. So you just come in the program and we'll tell you. And I've told you now. So hopefully you don't chase an anchor foolishly to your demise. Having a compelling thesis is also critical and raising the VC fund. In your experience, what are the most convincing thesis? Because as you remember our conversation about my thesis for new managers trying to differentiate themselves and want also mistakes to emerging managers to writing their thesis. Yeah, so your investment thesis, we have like a Mad Lib style template. So if you just search, VC investment thesis, and you'll see something on Go VC Lab, and, and you have a one sentence. And it's basically, it has all the information that an LP needs to make a decision to invest. And so, it's to take a step back in the world of venture, they're generalists and they're specialists. And for the most part, at this point, limited partners don't want generalists, right? They want specialists. And because they're like interested in something, right? I'm a limited partner. I want to invest money and I don't want to give it to someone to invest in anything, right? Because I'm like, I don't know, where are you going to invest in it? Well, it could be AI, it could be med tech, it could be, you know, I don't know, like uh, ball bearings, 
Williams. It's like, what? So they, they say, look, I, as a limited partner, I have a real interest in sustainability. So I want to invest in sustainability. So they want to look for, they are looking for specialists in sustainability, or I'm interested in climate change, or I'm interested in med tech, or I'm interested in AI, right? So they want specialist funds. And so your thesis has your fund size, uh, your location, your stage, right? Like, are you are you a seed, pre-seed, Series A, etc.? I'm kind of, I'll go through each of these. Um, the sectors you're focusing on, the things you're specializing in, and then why you, right? We call that the secret sauce. And so LPs literally, and we work with LPs all day long. We have a, over a unlimited partners in our database. Okay, I would say that we know more about venture capital limited partners than almost anyone in the world, and they want specialists, right? They and so we can go through each. Let's leave us aside fund size because we already talked about it. So let's go to like stage, right? They want a specific stage. They don't want early stage, late stage. They want you pre-seed series A because they are limited partners are investing in a number of managers and they'll say, hey, I'm interested in investing in the early stage. So I will make a seed stage bet. I'll make a pre-seed stage bet. I'll make an angel stage bet. But if you say you're early stage, they're like, ah, uh, uh, I don't know what that is exactly. I have a fund manager doing pre-seed. I know what that is. I have someone doing seed. I know what that is. I don't know what early stage is, so I'm not investing in you. So you're out. Next is geography, okay? <clears throat> a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I'll invest anywhere. That's just shows that you have no idea what you're talking about, okay? The rules in Turkey are radically different than the rules in Europe. And even within Europe, the rules in Estonia are radically different than the rules in Finland, right? So if you're like, I'm just going to invest in Europe, like, do you, are you including the UK? In, are you including Turkey in that? And then like, do you have lawyers and people in all those countries that you're planning to invest in? So that's one problem on the deal side. But there's another huge problem. Every country, every place you invest in, these vehicles are passed through for the limited partners. So the limited partners have to pay taxes, file forms, all this crap everywhere you invest. And they guess what? They don't want to do that. So they're like, yeah, you're investing worldwide. Like where worldwide? Like anywhere worldwide. They're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't like, I don't want to go to some sub-Saharan African country and have to fill out forms and pay taxes because you did an investment in sub-Saharan Africa. So they're just like, I'm out. So they like contained geographies because they understand what the tax issues are, what the filing issues are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So LPs don't want you to invest everywhere in the world. They want you to invest in specific geographies. And then let's sector we talked about, right? They're interested in sectors. So let's go to the secret sauce or why you. You're asking these people to give you money to do like sight unseen to invest blindly into assets. Okay. So it's like, hey, give me a million dollars. I'm going to invest in climate tech. It's like, okay, I'm going to suspend disbelief for a moment. Why should I give you a day of a million dollars to invest in climate tech? Well, I care about the climate. Okay, I care about the climate too. But why should I give you money to invest in? I can just, I care about the climate. You care about the climate. I can invest in climate. Uh, I know some people who also care about the climate might want to start a company. You know, okay, that's lame. I'm not going to, right? So it's got to, you got to have a very compelling reason why you are the person to take their money and invest it blindly into assets. And number one is like, I've been investing in climate. I've done 23 deals and I've got a 5X markup on those investments. Oh, okay. So, and you've done this before and got pretty good returns. That's a reason to back you, right? So you got to find the reason why you are uniquely qualified to take this money from a limited partner and invest it into companies. And when you find that reason, that secret sauce, that why you, 
then limited partner money flows. And we've quantified this. So I'm going to, I'll tell you, if your thesis, which includes the YU is bad, one in 10 or worse, people will decide to invest. And you could say, well, that doesn't sound that bad, but you need at least 50 limited partners in your fund, at least to get off the ground. I don't know how many you have, Barack. You know, you have a smaller number. So most people are 50 to 100. But if you're at worse than one in 10, you have to literally pitch hundreds of people, many hundreds. So let's say the average is 50 and you're at one in 15. I mean, you're at 700 people that you have to, seven limited partners that you have to pitch in order to close your fund. That's insane. That will take you years, years. So a good thesis will be one in five or better, sometimes two in five and sometimes three in five. That changes the whole calculus of raising your fund. Right now you can do it in nine months or 18 months or 12 months versus many years. Thank you very much for sharing invaluable experiences as always and the insights with me today. I appreciate all the information that you provided to us about entrepreneurship and also different topics. Thank you, Barack. This was amazing. You know, let me just say that I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship and venture capital everywhere in the world. Obviously, you know, friends with a lot of amazing people from Turkey. I think it's a thriving ecosystem. And uh, and frankly, that region of the world is very exciting because I think entrepreneurship really does have the chance, best chance to make the world into the place that we want to live in. We're creating a lot of problems in the world and entrepreneurship is fixing a lot of those problems as well. And so we really need people. Here's how I'm going to leave everyone with this thought. If you see something that's a problem, fix it. If you're passionate about that particular problem, then start a company. And if there's a problem set that you're really passionate about, start a fund. And that's how we're going to get out of the problems that we're facing in the world today. Fixing everything that you see, starting companies to fix things that you care about, and starting funds to fix wider problem sets. Thank you very much again. Thank you.